I'd like to take you on a whirlwind tour to the Middle Pacific for a short time this afternoon and uh, begin in my best version of a Polynesian accent by sharing with you an ole or a chant well known from ancient Hawaii. <clears throat> E pele'e ke akua o ka pohaku anena elele ka'u mai. And uh, this is widely regarded as an ancient ole or chant, which translates as uh, O pele honuamea, spirit of the burning stone, possess me with awe. The Hawaiian Islands are the summits of over a hundred very large volcanoes mostly submerged that stretch over 5,000 nautical miles across the uh, northwest floor of the Pacific Basin. And geologists regard them today as the physical manifestations of what's ambiguously called a hot spot rooted deep inside the earth. The early Hawaiians had their own uh, view, of course, toward the origin of these islands. Uh, they lacked geophysical instrumentation uh, and uh, spoke of them in their oral traditions as the products of the struggle between Pele, the goddess of fire, and her sister, Namaka o Kaha'i, who is the spirit of the sea. And metaphorically speaking, uh, this is a highly accurate representation of what we regard as uh, our uh, current geological understanding. Kilauea is the most active volcano in Hawaii. Uh, the place name Kilauea translates roughly as rising smoke cloud. And it's here that Pele uh, is supposed to reside. This is her home. And where traditional Hawaiians, even up to the present, will come and offer sacrifices of uh, uh, endemic halo berries and tea leaves and pork. It's even rumored that the corpse of Kamehameha the Great, the unifier of the Hawaiian kingdom in the late uh, 18th century was interned here in a, in a secret cave that's since been buried by lava. Here too in 1912 uh, on the rim of the crater of Kilauea at summit uh, an eccentric scientist uh, fled his home and family uh, in Massachusetts, an MIT professor. His name was Thomas Augustus Jagger and he established the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory. As much a showman as a scientist, he uh, was in the desperate strait of trying to raise money in order to pursue his research, so he published a, a, a great series of articles and books uh, uh, set to the mood and taste of the times in order to generate uh, interest and in funding. Uh, for example, his last big publication uh, came out when World War II was rolling around, and he, call, he called it... Um, Volcanoes declare war. And that's, we look at that as kind of hyperbolic and silly today, but it really worked. It uh, raised a lot of money. He invented a car that could be converted into a, uh, a motorboat. All you had to do was drive right into the sea. I kind of like that idea. Had a pet monkey. Uh, built a house right on the rim of the crater. And uh, some uh, urban legend has it that his... Uh, his outhouse was actually perched out over space beyond that rim there. <laughs> that pretty much is a view of uh, what he could see out his uh, uh, backyard window. So uh, he was close to his work and uh, established a facility today which is foremost of its kind uh, in terms of, of the world. And one reason that the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory succeeded so well is that Kilauea is uh, in a state of near continuous eruption widely regarded uh, as a drive-in volcano, a place where uh, tourists can actually creep up close to the edge of a molten lava flow and uh, uh, even stick in a, a postcard to burn a corner or uh, tap in a quarter to, to create a fossil in the lava as it cools and hardens. We now know, though, that uh, Kilauea, at least from what we've discerned uh, about its history over the past few thousand years is a dangerously explosive volcano, more powerfully so than Mount St. Helens. Uh, 
Uh, it's just that in the time of recent recorded history, modern times, the volcano has behaved in a very benign and, and fairly uh, low-key fashion. It's great for the tourist industry and local residents, but uh, a long history of violence. In the late 18th century, an eruption killed uh, a few hundred Hawaiians, maybe a few thousand, in fact. And it's to this landscape that I came as an undergraduate student to study how volcanoes are studied, never having seen a volcanic eruption before. The landscape seemed benign in a uh, way that uh, uh, allured me into thinking I'd love to live here, nice tropical balmy air at 4,000 feet on the island of Hawaii. But then one morning I came to work uh, at the observatory and the place was a buzz, uh, electric with excitement, something special was happening. And I couldn't feel it at the time, but the instruments told a tale that the whole top of the mountain was shuddering, experiencing a continuous low-level earthquake with a center of shaking positioned several miles south of the crater rim in, uh, in what was fairly wild jungle, uh, except for one dead-end road that transected that portion of the mountain. So my supervisor, uh, Robert Tilling, a well-known volcanologist, a graduate of Pomona College, uh, said, well, Rick, you know, how would you like to join a field team and, and go tell us what, uh, what it's like out there? My God, I don't know about this. It's a scary, uncertain situation. But I was so interested, what can I do but, uh, but say, sure, I'll go. And off we went, down a dead-end road into that uh, jungle uh, in a four-wheel drive, stopping at one visitor overlook, uh, and s stepping out to stretch our legs. It didn't take long, more than uh, a few moments, to begin experiencing a most peculiar sensation. Uh, the ground felt as though it were the crust of some quivering bowl of jello. I mean, it was possible, in fact, uh, for people sensitive about seasickness to feel really uneasy just standing there. And moreover, the trees were speaking to us. We could hear groaning sounds as the, the branches and boughs scraped past one another and the roots uh, strained uh, elastically back and forth. No wind blowing, but the unsteady earth causing these trees to complain. It wasn't but a few moments later that a patrol vehicle pulled up into the... Uh, uh, parking area, and the ranger shouted out, get off this road, the eruption's begun, you'll be trapped, leave now. We dove into the vehicle, uh, the six or seven of us, and sped up the road, noticing off to the west that the sky was becoming obscured by a great roiling cloud of brown-colored smoke. In fact, the earth was zipping open in our direction, and we escaped being trapped by a mere few tens of seconds. So you can bet uh, a little old undergraduate like me, my heart was pounding like a hammer. We got up to the uh, intersection with another road, turned left to see if we could get a view of what was happening more clearly. And sure enough, off to the south, across the treetops, a whole chain of geysers of molten lava hot enough to melt steel was feeding the great brown cloud that had attracted our attention shortly before. The lava from the fissure, the new crack in the earth, poured 130 feet deep into a half mile wide crater laid out before us. And to me, the sound of that uh, escaping lava resembled nothing so much as that of hundreds of fire hoses turned on full blast, or, uh, you know, the sound, if you can picture it, of, of a big waterfall uh, cascading to the bottom not far away. And the lava itself resembled tomato soup. I was rather stunned at the color, uh, with some scabs of silver gray crust here and there. Uh, the crater separating us from the new fissure was so wide that uh, I felt psychologically safe standing where I was, about a half mile from the activity. 
But then a friend of mine, a fellow student, came up and tapped my shoulder and said, uh, Rick, this is strange. Take a look at this. And walking over, we saw on the earth a, uh, a, a trough in the gravel that was, uh, my God, it's moving. It's getting wider and it's getting deeper. And the little roots of plants uh, along this trench are being pulled straight tightened and snapped. Bad news. Uh, Robert Tilling, who was standing there next to us, said, uh, stand back, get up slope, get upwind. And we watched as this trough turned into a crack from which, in a matter of seconds, uh, a great sound emerged, like the exhalation of a giant, uh, accompanied by a cloud of dense white steam in which blobs of the same tomato soup were hurled into the air. We had seen the birth of a new vent, a new fissure, right at our feet. And we watched this crack open, propagate, at about the pace of a slow walk. I couldn't help but the whole time think that uh, underneath something big was moving, and, and by golly, that's a creepy feeling, when in fact another fissure opened up right on the road itself, close to the vehicles, which had to be moved away. And in fact, for a few intense minutes, it felt as though the whole landscape was falling apart all around us, uh, a sensation that's so uh, uh, riveting, uh, an odd combination of terror and interest mixed together. We didn't know it at the time, though. This was the climax of the eruption. The geological storm was over, and in the following few hours, uh, activity subsided. So by nightfall, we could uh, travel along these closed roads and find cracks in the earth next to the lava flow through which uh, pale blue flames of gases, uh, organic matter and, and plant material combusted by the heat of the lava played, much like the burners on a kitchen stove, hour after hour. Years have passed since this event. I must say that it comes back to me in the form of dreams that uh, sometimes I find quite disturbing. And the dreams go something like this. I'm traveling across the Kilauea landscape, uh, which uh, looks familiar to me, but isn't really the Kilauea landscape. It's distorted and modified in, in the way that dreams can change things. When an eruption begins uh, in a location that I can safely examine, begins to spread, uh, ultimately moves in new directions, and uh, suddenly uh, puts me in a position which I realize I'm trapped. At that point, I wake up irritated. What do these dreams mean? They come to me when I'm really busiest, that is, uh, most anxious about work, which can sometimes consume 80 or 100 hours a week. And uh, I'm sure that they indicate some fear of losing control or being exposed to forces beyond my control. But there's more to it than that. These dreams illustrate the fine line between awe and pure terror, uh, sometimes uh, unexpectedly so. And they remind me that living in a city like Los Angeles, as I have for many, many years, uh, is to enter a cocoon in which the importance of the nature beyond us shrinks to superficiality. And I think alarmingly so, given the era in which we live of rapid climate change, pollution, and resource depletion. A place like Kilauea dispels this illusion and uh, is a powerful teacher for people who are open about learning new things, not just about the, uh, the physical world, but in the, uh, in the spirit of the Hawaiian olis, emotionally too. For example, better to see where that lava flow or any flow is going to get upslope and upwind when a big event impacts your life. As, a, as an attitude, a personal attitude, this helps us deal with the great changes that we all must face inevitably in our lives. And I think uh, both uh, enriches deeply 
and makes more meaningful the life experience. Mahalo nui loa. Thanks for listening.